100 million years before the birth of the first pharaoh, the deserts of Egypt were verdant Edens, teeming with life. At the top of this food chain, dinosaurs ruled. Nearly 100 years ago, a German aristocrat named Ernst Stromer ventured deep into this wasteland, searching for clues to its prehistoric past. The strange monsters he discovered would astonish the scientific community, only to be blasted into dust by man-made fire from the skies. For the next half a century, a hidden world lay buried under these shifting sands, until a team of young scientists set out to resume Stromer's quest. Their mission? To unearth the remains of the lost dinosaurs of Egypt. Their discovery? Something so unexpected, it would supply one vital missing piece to the puzzle of a forgotten world. With time running out on their field season, the team's hopes of making a significant find are fading. We're gonna get rid of all this top crap and you're gonna work your way down until you find the topmost part of the fossil. This place is a lot harder to work in than we'd expected. We'd really like to have, you know, a real showpiece discovery, you know, something that I can say, you know, look, this is a, femur of Carcharodontosaurus, you know, you've added to the knowledge base of the world, but we haven't had that yet. It's been sort of funny for us to watch these dinosaur guys go up and down and up and down. Look at this, look at this. I didn't see that before. And then they find something and it's the greatest thing ever and then by the end of the day it stinks and, you know, it's not good for anything and they're all depressed. You know, when you dream about going to a place for basically 15 years, I think when you get there and you don't find exactly what you'd hoped for, you know, your hopes are a little bit let down. An advantage that Jen and I have is that we get to range far and wide. We see a lot more of the oasis um, than the paleontologists do. Consequently, we come across more bones. Once again, the geology team changes the whole group's fortunes in an instant. We were working on the, the topographic data. We drove by. Uh, Jen said, hey, <laughs> do those look like bones? We backed up. I said, yeah, indeed they do. We decided to take a few more readings and then alert the paleontologist. <laughs> we found the bones by driving over them. I felt a little bad about that, but I guess it's better than not finding it at all. <laughs> hey, Tree, come here. There's a whole line of it coming out right there. Um, it looks like we found potentially a skeleton. <laughs> this is what it looks like when you have the real thing. We just doubled our at least on the surface where it's <laughs> just doubled our take in about you know, even if we don't get anything more than this float here. I'll tell you, it seems like Chewy the key to Bajaria is driving. The average person walking by would see this and go, ah, it's nothing. That looks a lot like burnt firewood. But what we have on the ground here is a lot of little pieces of fossil, what we like to call float. Hopefully what it is is something that's weathering out of a place where there's more dinosaur bone that's actually together, maybe a whole skeleton possibly even one of Stromer's lost dinosaurs.
Stromer's dinosaur, Gyptosaurus, belongs to a group of plant-eating dinosaurs called Titanosaurs. Some of its relatives got to truly gigantic sizes, 90 to 100 tons in weight. Gyptosaurus was a relatively middle-sized titanosaur at approximately 40 feet long and about 15 tons in weight. What's unusual about Egyptosaurus is that it's the only plant-eating dinosaur that Stromer found in Bahiria. The question that raises is, if we have all these giant predatory dinosaurs running around, where are the prey species? Peter Dodson inspects the new site. What is that? Or what did it used to be? Ooh, oh, ooh, 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 ooh. Okay, now that, is that a radius, maybe? Okay, well, it looks to me like we got a definite maybe here. Just might. How many people do you think you can put in here? I think we could put quite a few if we had to. We got to decide how we're going to divide things up, though. Yeah, okay. I am of the opinion that we should sort of start cleaning up some of the other sites that we had started. Um, yeah, well, we need to discuss that. Let's get everybody get going. All right. We were pissed off at each other because we sort of had a different idea as to how to work the dig. Matt convinces Josh to complete their work at the site where they found a theropod ilium. I want whoever found this bone killed immediately. <laughs> There's been some tense moments. Everybody here has a lot to be thinking about right now. Um, and Josh, Josh is feeling some pressure from that. He channeled his anger really well and basically smashed the rock into oblivion. So, you know, if you, if you can get him to channel the anger the right way and he's not, like, breaking my jaw or anything like that, it's really a good thing when we get pissed off at each other. When you're the leader of an expedition, you feel like everyone's looking at you to make the right decision. Any wrong decision means a royal waste of time, and at this point, that could really hurt us. Damn. What? We left the foil. What? <laughs> Do we need it? I'll go get it. Um, I need somebody's feet. Okay. Here. Um, so either. I'll get it. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. The problem is, education can take you only so far in the field. A lot of it's instinct, and you can be wrong. My guy's son's dropping. Okay. They wrap the newly excavated bone first with aluminum foil, then with plaster-soaked strips of burlap, a process called jacketing. Do you think you could have found heavier burlap? Okay, so here you go. Dude, we could build a plane out of this. The plaster jacket is going to serve the same purpose as a medical cast will. If you break your arm, a doctor will put a cast on your arm to keep those bones in place. That's exactly what we want to have happen. I'm calling my congressman. This is like pottery. We could fire this. <laughs> When all was said and done, the site where we thought we had a predatory dinosaur turned out to be a total waste. The ilium that we jacketed was really the only bone that was worth studying. Taking a much needed break from their exacting work, the scientists check out a local Bedouin music club.
for a while I was a, a union musician. I was uh, the house drummer at the Golden Nugget in Atlantic City. Even though I couldn't speak with some of these guys, we were speaking with music. The Egyptians' deep-seated spiritual philosophies touch every aspect of their daily lives. Five times each day, the Egyptian scientists on the expedition team stop their work in order to pray. We are Muslims, and every Friday we go to pray at noon together. Fortunately, we found a mosque near the site. Surprisingly, the Imam was an amazing man for having the ability to remind us of the importance of science. Because the people in the oasis think there's no connection between them and science. like we here at the sauropod site are going to get hammered? Well, this could change the day a bit, Chewy. Damn. Jen and Ken are going to get torn up up there. We have probably seen wind gusts that I would guess are, are close to hurricane speed. I would say they're at least in the 50 mile per hour range. I've felt kind of buoyant up there a couple times, which isn't a great feeling when you're standing on a cliff. What should we do? Nothing. Just keep going? Yeah, just keep working. Uncovering something and 30 seconds later it's covered back up. Chewie's turning into a, a pharaoh over here. He's all covered. Well, you wanna, what do you want to do? Do you want to bag it totally? What do you What do you think about going over to Jesus? What do you think about going over to Spain? I don't try it, I mean. so completely disgusted with having sand encrusted eyes. You don't want to step on anything, but you don't want to open your eyes to see where you're not wanting to step. Oh, man. Sure, come out to the desert, have a few drinks, it'll be fun. The sandstorm we had today was a real downer because it wasted another day for us. We've only got two weeks left. That's good. That's right very, very, very spot. good. He's got a bone going right down where he thought he had one going right down. Well, that was here. After weeks like. of prospecting, evaluating, and digging, members of the Baharia Dinosaur Project have yet to unveil a single major new find. Their hopes continue to dwindle as the once promising sauropod site takes on the quality of an already plundered crypt. Josh, are you thinking what I'm thinking? That we're, that we're digging out something that's man-made. What I said the other day about be, being the real thing, uh, it was uh, apparently the real thing at one point, but it looks like, again, somebody was here before us too. We're always following an old Uncle Ernst's footsteps, and I think that it's time to look elsewhere. I think that's Jebel Harbor. Well, Jebel Harbor is really part of the east. Are we going east? Yeah. In an abrupt change of strategy, Josh leads a few team members to the site where he discovered his first Egyptian dinosaur bone a year earlier. 
It is an area of the Bahariya oasis never mentioned in Stromer's very precise diaries. So what's your feel? Go that way or go that way? I split everyone into groups to go prospecting. And because we were in a new locality that most of us had never been to before, one of the main rules was always stay in radio contact. I led my group a little bit too far away from uh, the original team, just far enough to be out of radio contact, and made Josh really mad. Dude, I had a GPS, relax. We didn't even know if Steve was with you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I called you back, and I could hear like fuzziness. That's all shit. we could hear. Okay, well. I think these guys were pretty confident that we could find the way back too. So hey, yeah, GPS. Yeah, we yeah. both have GPSs. Like, chill. Anyway, first of all, we found this weird green stuff that's just kind of like the Bahubariel. Do you think it's glockenite? Numerous pieces like this. Oh, you're almost forgiven. And then I found this. Atlas X. Oh, exquisite. Matt's discovery of some well-preserved fossils is the first encouraging sign they've had in days. All right, you're forgiven, but please don't go that far again. Let's go do some freaking prospect. Can't do anything right around here. Matt's getting pissy, we're taking too long. I didn't find anything, I'm just waiting for Chewie to follow me. He's supposed to be my partner, he's sitting next there. Chewie! Come on! In 1941, Ernst Stromer was among the millions swept up in a storm of another kind, the Second World War. Stromer himself openly opposed the Nazis' cause. He was a, a very bitter against the, uh, the, the National Socialist for the character of the war. He um, didn't accept this war at all. Traditionally, Baron Stromer von Reichenbach standing as a member of the German aristocracy would automatically qualify his three sons for officer status. But Stromer's vocal opposition to the Nazis meant his sons Ullmann, Gerhard, and Wolfgang would become virtual cannon fodder, sent to the front lines as infantrymen. At the beginning of the war, my husband and um, his elder brother were naturally drafted immediately. His elder brother died in Russia, which was, of course, an enormous blow for the family. I also know that uh, Ernst um, didn't show very much emotion about it, but felt it all the more. In 1945, 17-year-old Gerhard Stromer was killed in action a few months after his enlistment. Less than two weeks later, Germany surrendered. Ernst suffered naturally appallingly under the death of the two boys and just went downhill after that. Russian soldiers captured Stromer's only surviving son, Wolfgang, incarcerating him in a prison work camp. There was a, a particularly long time where they didn't know what had happened to him. World War I had forced Stromer to abandon many of his important Egyptian discoveries on a pier in Alexandria. The Second Great War committed two of his sons to the ground, another to a Russian labor camp. But Stromer would sustain one more grave loss. April 1944. In a determined effort to wipe out Munich's communication and railway systems, Allied bombers reduced whole blocks of this Bavarian city to ashes.
When the smoke cleared, the Munich Museum of Paleontology, located near Nazi party headquarters, had also been devastated. Virtually all of Ernst Stromer's fossil finds from Egypt were destroyed. Despondent over this series of losses, Stromer and his wife clung to the hope that their last surviving son would come back to them alive. The Russians finally released Wolfgang Stromer in 1950. My grandfather was very, very happy that at least one of his sons came back. He just survived to see my father back and see him married and know that I was to come. Ernst Stromer passed away at the age of 82 on December 18th, 1952. During the years following his death, Ernst Stromer's scientific legacy slowly began to fade, becoming an historical footnote to all but the most dedicated paleontologists. We came to Egypt hoping to rediscover one of Stromer's lost dinosaurs. But as it turns out, we found something completely different. Hey, Chewy, look at this. Same bone, different yeah, bone? I, think it's I don't the same know. Bone. It's really dense, it's really well put together, and it's happy. I like this. I like this a lot. The Bahariya Formation is again being ironic to us. Uh, this is the first site that Jen Geeg and I found last year, and it's turned out to be the best site we've seen thus far. Let's see, see if these guys have been wasting their time or not. Okay, what do we got going here? We got a bone. You can step anywhere in here. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Uh, okay, Ooh, what the hell is this? That's End of a limb bone going in. Something really big. Something really Very big. Similar to Look at this. Kind of. That looks scappy. Right? Yeah. The blade we of got this guy here. Water. Okay, all right. Which I think is separate from that one over there. Okay, that's heavy. If that's rib, that's way heavy. Right. Change. This is all bone in here. Okay, okay, okay. Right? See that one sticking out? Okay. We got all kinds of junk going on over there. Well, you know what I think? I think, yahoo! I think we got it, hey! I think we got it, guys. Hey, 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 hey. I think this is what Uncle Ernst missed. Yeah, we felt great. We were all just at the top of the world. But of course, now the real work was about to begin. Members of the expedition finally locate what they believe is a significant find, the remains of a plant-eating dinosaur. This is where he went because Uncle Ernst couldn't read a map, huh? What's more, the bones seem to be what paleontologists call associated, that is, all belonging to the same animal. This site's definitely an upper. I mean, it's an associated dinosaur. It's multiple bones of presumably one creature. So perhaps this is Egyptosaurus, or perhaps it's a new species, which is something that we'd hope for as well. There are some vertebrae, we think, possibly a rib or two. There's a lot of long bones. There's a scapula, coracoid, shoulder blade, shoulder girdle kind of stuff. Uh, maybe a humerus. That would be really, really sweet to have a humerus. She's not going to be pretty to take out, but she'll come out. Yeah, the bones are kind of in a big heap. On top One of each other. right on top That's of the other. Especially if this is the end yeah. of a humerus or something and oh. it's going down, we are in a lot of trouble. Yeah, boy. We started to understand the significance of the sauropod probably day two or day three of the excavation. We had a long cylindrical bone and we just kept following it and kept following it. It became what we call an energizer bone. It just kept going and going and going. And there were ribs lying on top of it all over the place. Lo and behold, Jason has uncovered the biggest sauropod humerus I've ever seen in my life. The size of this bone was absolutely astonishing. It was definitely the largest bone that I had ever dealt with. The detectives have found another piece of the puzzle. But what kind of colossal beast is spread out before them? Once the team wraps the many bones with jackets of plaster and burlap, the enormous protective shells create another dilemma. Some of these jackets weighed upwards of seven, 800 pounds. 
gotta get underneath it. We can't lift it. Well, you guys gotta get on one side or the other. Basically, this is crunch time. We're working around the clock. We have a lot of fossil to get out of the ground, and we need to get out of here. How's the jacket on your end, Janice? It's, um, it's a little crumbly at the bottom, but I think it'll hold. We got 10 or 11 people around one of these jackets, and we strained and scrunted. OK, good. Me and Matt got the heavy end. Well, then lift yours up a little more. Can we get it to the lip? Yeah, let's hurry up and make it to the Before I get a hernia. All right. All right. Go, go down here. Down here. Matt, you good? Well, I think we set a new record for inefficiency in getting that sauropod out, but it's out. Okay, she's kind of teetering. Up like this. Yeah. I can hold it. Quickly. Let's do it. Right. Here, here. Where's that short? short one. One. Please don't take all Three months after their discovery, nearly 12,000 pounds of fossils arrive at a temporary home. Philadelphia's Academy of Natural Sciences. Which way do you want to pivot? The jackets are kept inside the Academy's lab, where the next phase of the investigation begins. We think we've got about 20% of the animal. Wow. So we found an associated skeleton. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. It's enough to figure out where it belongs, who he is, what his name is, you know, if it's a new critter, it's enough to name it. Look at that. The DP is still good. That, ladies and gentlemen, would be a dinosaur humerus. So we're talking about the front, the forelimb, the right forelimb of a very, very large dinosaur. So this is the top of the uh, humerus here, and you're moving down towards the bottom, which isn't there. The distal end is actually, there's a, there was a fracture, and we jacketed them as two separate elements. So um, it, the bone itself actually continues on for another couple of feet. Simply preparing these bones for study is an enormously painstaking process. Jason Poole and his colleagues will spend the next several months meticulously restoring and cleaning every fossil. I'm not even used to working uh, or visualizing on this scale, so I, I keep looking at this and, and going, okay, this is going to be a learning experience. While Jason begins his exacting work, Josh, Matt, and Ken set out to discover more about the man who inspired their mission. The journey takes them to Munich's Museum of Paleontology. God, they were ugly spuds, weren't they? We had a twofold mission in coming to Munich. Partially, we wanted to learn more about, well, who is this guy Stromer? What makes him tick? Curator Dr. Helmut Mayer and the scientist are the first people to dig through a collection of personal papers, donated to the museum by Stromer's son, Wolfgang, just before he died. Stromer with the Bacheriosaurus femur. That's cool. The items include more than 100 never-before-seen glass slides, taken by Stromer and his colleagues during their expeditions to Egypt. Oh, look at this. Oh, beauty. Libby oh, Coast. Oh, great, Sucus. fine, baby. Oh, man, please have some of your dinosaurs. Please have some of your dinosaurs. Look at that. Yeah, please have some of your dinosaurs. Holy cow. Figure, but it's, I wish. Oh. That's a photo, dude. This is, is a photograph. Oh, man. Uh, excuse me. These, ah! Nobody knows these exist. Nobody knows these Matt. exist. It's really oh awesome. Oh, God. I know, I see. I see. Oh, man. He had it mounted. There's your He did? He had it mounted. Yeah. I realized, ooh, this is Spinosaurus in the museum before it was bombed. All of a sudden, we've got a photograph of the bones rather than just Stromer's drawings. So we can get information from the original Spinosaurus that no one has access to. Back in a Philadelphia bar the year before their expedition, Josh and Matt dreamed of finding an associated skeleton of a Spinosaurus. Yeah, that's, that's Look at this, Matt. He had it freaking mounted. Yeah. Now they've discovered the only one in the world. Not in a bed of rock, but in a box of memories. This piece of glass is the closest thing the world has to this, this animal. Yeah. This As aside from yeah. this and a couple of teeth that are currently sitting in my office, 
there is nothing of this animal known to science. Other right than now. figures in his papers. Yeah. And not all these vertebrae were figures, I don't think. That's a discovery. <laughs> Pretty old in this This is the original museum? Uh, holy! This is, it's a disaster. I mean, the structure is still there, but everything's burned out. Yeah. The windows are gone. Everything is rubble everywhere. Oh, that's something. Goodbye, dinosaurs. Okay. For some reason, that just hits me. And it's not. I don't know why, but it really hits me. Today, a government office stands on the site of the original museum of paleontology. I was standing there looking at that building, and I was just trying to imagine sort of what it would be like to watch your entire life's work burn away right before your eyes. I just felt this immense sense of loss. How much of this general area was damaged? Knowing about Stromer and his story, it's very inspirational to us. It makes us feel like we're doing more than going out and just collecting dinosaurs for our own glory. We're also replacing this man's legacy, and uh, that gives our expedition a little bit more meaning to all of us, definitely. Armed with their new knowledge of Stromer and his lost world, the team travels to yet another time and place to try and understand the nature of their giant beast and the lush landscape in which it made its home. A dinosaur discovery involves more than simply digging up bones. In Philadelphia, Baharia Dinosaur Project geologists Ken Lacavera and Jen Smith analyzed the several hundred pounds of sediment, rock, and plant materials they collected in Egypt. This looks like kind of a lump of dirt, but within this uh, is, is a heck of a lot of information. You can see there's plant fossils in here. There's also little tiny bits of wood in here. So we, we can tell what plants lived here, what environment this was deposited in. And this particular specimen I took from one of Stromer's excavations that we rediscovered. So Stromer actually worked in this, in this very rock right here. Based on the collected samples and observations to date, Ken proposes an unexpected hypothesis regarding Egypt's ancient history. These are really beautiful. Rooms. The analogy that I've kind of been using in my head as a working model has been the Gulf Coast of the United States. And we've been seeing deposits on Aldis that are very reminiscent to what you might find in the 10,000 Islands area of Florida, where you have an open estuary, and in Florida's case, of, of mangrove islands that just opens out into the marine realm. If we are reading the rocks in Bahia correctly, then South Florida looks to be the most likely modern environment that looks like what the environment was the dinosaurs were running around in in Egypt 100 million years ago. Oh, this is lovely. All right. That should be good. Yeah, it's about to go down. That'll be fine. When you visit the Everglades, the thing that really jumps out at you is that the place is just teeming with life. There, there are plants everywhere, there are fish everywhere. That is cool. That's pretty nice. Look at the size of those pods. Wow. The roots are enormous. The top of the food chain is occupied by a big reptile in the Everglades. Those are the, the fruits. Yeah. So it, it certainly appears in the Cretaceous and it appears today that those type environments were very productive environments. Those are really dense. On the Florida expedition, the team collects and photographs evidence of environments similar to those found in the ancient Egyptian sediment deposits. Here we have marine deposits, just like we saw in Baharia. And right over top of the marine deposits are mangrove roots, soon to form mangrove salt marsh deposits. The only place where you can get marine sand with these marsh deposits right on top 
are places where the wave energy is very low, where the tide energy is very low, and where you have a tough plant like these mangroves that can, that can grow right out into the marine realm. And that's what we see in Baharia, and that's why we think that these dinosaurs were living in a mangrove salt marsh in a very low energy environment on the shore of the Tethys Seaway. The leaves wow, don't look seem at to this. care. Pretty nice. Look at that. Look at those roots coming out. 20 yards that way. The South Florida analog is really cool in that we can put more components of the ecosystem together than just the dinosaurs in sediments that look similar. We've got sharks in the Bajaria Formation. There are sharks in Florida. We've got all sorts of fish. The faunas are matching up much closer than I expected them to. If a carnivore gets in here and he's following you, getting out isn't gonna be easy. Basically, we've got dinosaurs hanging out in and amongst these islands of mangrove sorts of trees and in the tidal channels and in the lagoons behind them. pretty significant thing. I don't think anybody's seen dinosaurs do this. Analysis of the sediment deposits, patterns of sea levels, rising and falling tides, comparisons between flora and fauna, both ancient and modern. Such evidence gathered by the scientists could provide vital information about the relationship between our planet's past and its possible future. Understanding the Earth's history is exceedingly important in that it gives us context for what we're running into today with a changing climate. Um, it sort of lets us know what we might be in for. Sea level is rising today. Coastlines are changing. Uh, I think it's like 80% of the world's population that's within 50 miles of a coast. So it's very important to understand how coasts change and respond through time. And, and how we might be able to deal with them in the future. How much of this is muscle attachment scar and how much of this is actual diet? The team returns from the Everglades to join bone preparator Jason Poole for the next phase of their work. This bone here is a caudal vertebra. It's one of the first tail vertebrae. They look for um, answers to the many riddles of their giant Egyptian sauropod before the bones must be returned to their homeland in Egypt. Could this be Egyptosaurus, Stromer's lost plant-eating dinosaur, or another animal altogether? We are trying to find out where it fits evolutionarily. We spend a lot of time measuring the bones. Matt and I will approach a skeleton describe the ever-living hell out of it. Yeah, um, it's really, really constricted. Yeah. Um, and it starts off a half meter approximately, then comes down to less than a quarter of a meter in the middle. Every bump, right. crack, so crevice, length, parameter that we can think of to measure, we will measure. Looks like... Stromer found many elements, many bones, in common with the, with the animal that we had. A lot of these elements overlap with Egyptosaurus, and you can directly compare them and figure out are they similar enough to be the same species. Based on distinctive characteristics found on the bones, Josh and Matt believe their creature, like Stromer's Egyptosaurus, derives from a group that includes some of the world's largest dinosaurs, titanosaurs. Yeah, actually, I think, uh, I think you can see sort of chevron facets right here. Mm -hmm. This new animal is totally different in the shape, specifically the shape of the humerus, than any other sauropod we have seen. We hypothesized that it was very, very large based on the skeletal proportions of other titanosaurs. Our humerus, for example, is much, much longer than almost every other titanosaur that's ever been found. We discovered several unique features in our skeleton uh, that led us to believe that 
the skeleton belonged to not only a new species, but to a new genus, a group of related species. This is, as we can tell right now, the second most massive sauropod dinosaur of all time. The next step, choosing an appropriate name for this gigantic new herbivore. We have an intertidal environment, which is known as a peralic environment. We have a very large creature living there, a titanic creature living there. So um, the name came to mind then, Tide Giant or Perala Titan, and I proposed this to the group and it caught on, I'm happy to say, so we, we now have Perala Titans living in the swamps of Baharia. Although they can only guess at the animal's skin color and texture, the scientists can make fairly accurate estimates of its size, shape, weight, and length. It was an enormous beast. It may have touched close to 100 feet long, could have been 70 tons. We're talking about a weight that ranges anywhere from 10 to 15 elephants. Uh, this thing weighed as much as a herd of elephants. If this animal is as big as we think it is, we just sort of keep pushing the envelope as to how big a terrestrial animal can get. Succeeding beyond their wildest expectations, the Baharia Dinosaur Project team had a true discovery on their hands. One that made headlines around the world. Like Stromer's finds nearly a century ago, Perala Titan fills in some important gaps in our knowledge about the world of the equatorial Cretaceous. We consider Perala Titan significant because we're adding a new form from North Africa. Ecologically, we have a pathetically large animal wandering around in an extremely productive ecosystem. There were these structures on the humerus that strongly resembled bite marks. That would mean that the animal was scavenged or might have even been attacked before it died. An adult Peralotitan was so enormous that even a big theropod, a theropod the size of Spinosaurus, probably wouldn't have attacked an adult. More likely, they would have gone after juveniles or a sick animal, one that was weakened in some way. key mystery still lingers, one that can only be solved by further expeditions to the Baharia oasis. We still have this paradox that Strom already mentioned several times, namely that we have these giant predators and nothing around to eat. So right now we have this very strange ecosystem with one giant, giant plant eater, perhaps a smaller plant eater, And then you have these giant predators. So obviously, there must still be a whole diversity, particularly of plant-eating dinosaurs out there, that would have been the kind of prey that these large predators could have subsisted on. When they came to the Egyptian desert, the Baharia Dinosaur Project team set out to continue the quest that Ernst Stromer began back in 1910. It's a mission they have only begun to fulfill. The first field season yielded frustrations, revelations, and an unexpected treasure, Perala Titan, one of the largest creatures to ever stride across the earth. 
I think it was absolutely as much of a success as a geology expedition as it was a paleontological expedition. We found a neat environment. We've got great evidence that it's like something that we can study in the modern world. We've got a hypothesis to test, and that's science. So you can't really ask for much more. I think the site is immensely promising. So I really think that, the, that there's every expectation that we will continue to find dinosaur fossils. For the amount of work that Stromer did, he's not well, well known. And in fact, he's most well known for having his dinosaurs destroyed. Now, we hope that our interest in Stromer can influence other people, and maybe the guy will get the sort of warm remembrance that he deserves. Like the work of Ernst Stromer von Reichenbach, the depth and breadth of the team's new breakthroughs may not be fully understood for years or even decades to come. And, as always in science, their discoveries lead to even deeper mysteries. They will return to this lonely stretch of desert again, seeking answers to their many questions. What exotic creatures are waiting to be found under the desert sands? Did predators like Spinosaurus fish and hunt in packs? And why was the Baharia region one of the most productive ecosystems on Earth? How did it perish? And are there any lessons we can learn from this history to help us see our ever-changing planet from a new perspective? Humans, uh, you know, think, yeah, we're at the top of the food chain and we dominate the planet and we're gonna be here forever. Well, we've only been here for a short time. The dinosaurs were around for 140 million years. Uh, humans have been around for 200,000 years. Through the study of such ancient worlds, our past can illuminate our future with insights that may someday help us to avoid extinction by our own hand. Change itself is inevitable. Self-destruction still an option.